Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Live from Northwoods and Waters. It's March 28th. We are right in the beginning of spring here in the Northwoods and feeling every bit of it, all of the cold. We have sandhill cranes that have come back that were out in our, our lake today with one leg up underneath them and all huddled up, poor guys. It's a rough time for the birds this year, I think. My name is Marty Harding and I am on the board of Northwoods and Waters of the St. Croix Heritage Area. Our goal is to unite the people of the St. Croix River watershed on behalf of all we share here, our natural, cultural, and historic resources. We cover a very large area, almost 8,000 square miles, that's in two states, Wisconsin and Minnesota. We have four nations, indigenous nations here who have ceded territory rights within the whole of the watershed. We also cover 18 counties and the rest of the stuff you can use in Trivial Pursuit someday. About 12,000 years of human history, once the glaciers were gone, people were here making this place their home. So we have three goals. We wanna create sustainable economic opportunities based on our heritage. We work really hard to connect the region. This particular um, show that we do once a month connects the region with from north to south and east to west. We also want to increase awareness and understanding. We do this, uh, increase awareness and understanding of our heritage and stories and the resources that demonstrate those stories because we want to raise awareness both with the people who live here, our children, our grandchildren, our, our youth, our adults, many of us, including myself, had no idea what was all here in this beautiful watershed. And then to promote and interpret the region to visitors and a global, global audience. Right now, there are 66 national heritage areas in the, in the country. The closest one to us is in Iowa, it's silos and smokestacks. If you've driven south into Iowa, you've gone through silos and smokestacks. Um, but there's 66 of them, none in Minnesota or Wisconsin. And so it is one of our goals also to put the national in our name and become a national heritage area. We do these programs live from Northwoods and Waters to share stories in a really informal and fun kind of way. Thomas Wayne King and Debbie King have been really involved with us in creating the content for this. Tonight we have Jeff Esterholm, who will read from More Groovy Gumshoes. And as we were coming online, he said, well, we're talking about crime and maple syrup, two things that um, I think Tom might actually bring together for us. That's a little teaser for our program. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Thomas Wayne King to get us going. Okay, yeah, thanks, Marty. And welcome everybody, Tom here. and. Debbie is just on the sideline here. You want to wave hi to everybody there? She's going to be our timer tonight for, for those of us who are reading. So Debbie and Mr. Sunshine, our, our Sheltie Hound, is, uh, is with us here tonight. Yeah, these uh, programs that Marty and the group have put together have turned into, just as she said in her email, a, a very nice eclectic effort. And so tonight, Jeff, who is just, just an incredibly accomplished author, and I'll read you a little intro here, and then Jeff will take it away in just a bit. But we're going to mesh his skill and his literary talent with crime writing with, among other things, the great Canada maple syrup heist of 2011-2012. So stay tuned when I, when I get to my part in the middle and then Debbie with hers with the recipes, we'll, we'll build that in there. So we're going to go right to Jeff Esterholm now. And let me read this quick, Jeff, and then I'll turn it over to you. Jeff right. Esterholm is a writer of short fiction living at the head of the Great Lakes in Superior, Wisconsin. Previously, he lived in Osceola, Wisconsin, a mere two blocks from the St. Croix River. And I'll add in that part of what our effort here is, is to show the art and the talent and what happens within the St. Croix watershed. We've got a lot of talent, a lot of productivity and ability. Jeff's work has appeared in various print and online crime fiction magazines. In 2013, his work won the Short Fiction Award from the Council for Wisconsin Writers. More Groovy Gumshoes is an, an anthology scheduled for release, Jeff's anthology, for release on April 10th by Down and Out Books. Jeff's debut short story collection, The Effects of Urban Renewal on Mid-Century America, is slated for publication by Cornerstone Press 
the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point this fall. So my great pleasure to introduce to you Jeff Esterholm, reading from Superior, but having lived in the watershed here or nearby and part of our St. Croix Writers Group for many years. Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to Tom and Marty for inviting me to uh, take part here. I sat in back in February to watch and get a feel for all this. Um, what I'll be reading to you tonight is a short story of mine called Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun. It's part of the anthology coming out April 10th by downandoutbooks.com on pre-order now. And um, the anthology is More Groovy Gumshoes, Private Eyes in the Psychedelic 60s. I'll start right off. This first scene is right from the beginning of the story. There were two killings of note that year. One took place on a motel balcony in Memphis, and the second in the kitchen of a Los Angeles hotel. Paul Cimarron lived in the upper Midwest in a port city on Lake Superior. The city of Superior in 1968 was insulated by physical distance and weather from the socio-political tumult that resulted from the assassinations. Although Paul Cimarron had photographs of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy reverently scotch taped to the cracked plaster wall beside his kitchenette table, a larger collage made up of glossies from Look, Life, and Time memorializing John Fitzgerald Kennedy, assassinated when Cimarron was a teenager, dwarfed those of the other two figures. The riots in the Paul Cimarron, the pot entrepreneur to his friends, found more to be anxious about waiting for a package arriving from the Netherlands, Amsterdam. He was concerned about ripoffs, though he was the one intent on pulling off the grift. He'd driven to the post office daily for the past week and a half, for the last past week and a half in his 64 Dodge Dart. A midnight blue, not bad junker he bought secondhand off his Uncle Dick. He went there again. Hiya, a package come in for me, Paul Cimarron? He had a post office box, but this package from his Amsterdam contact was going to be, as he told his friends, massive. Luckily, Cimarron thought, he had the dart. He was sure he wouldn't have been able to carry the package back to his apartment without the car. He was feeling wired. If someone touched him on the arm, he would explode. That feeling. He failed to catch the postal clerk eye him. The clerk recognized the young man and his name before grunting, yes, I believe there is a little something here. Cimarron nodded and said, cool. He checked the wanted posters on the bulletin board while the postal clerk, an Elmer Fudley grandpa, who he knew delivered mail years ago to his parents' three-bedroom ranch out in the park, waddled off to the back of the large room and the steel shelving filled with packages of all shapes and sizes. He looked at the FBI's most wanted, black and white, somewhat grainy, not a long hair among them. Cimarron muttered, criminals, and shook his head over his parents' generation. Here it is. The postal clerk set the package on the counter. I'll need your signature right here. Disappointed. The package was so much smaller than he had expected. He would have to tear into it back at his apartment. Paul Cimarron signed his name with a bit of autographical flourish, was handed the carbon, and then walked out of the post office's main entrance onto Tower Avenue, the box from Amsterdam under his right arm. The Dodge Dart was three spaces down on the southbound side of the street. Cimarron put the package on the passenger seat and pulled away. Watching him from an unmarked Ford Galaxy parked across the street was Denny Nord, a member of the city police department's fledgling narcotics unit. On his cross street to the north, an electric blue Cadillac with Minnesota plates sat idling, a certain Mr. Osborne, in town from Minneapolis, watching Cimarron. Nord eyeballed the dart from his rearview mirror. 
followed it until it took the left-hand turn going east. He's going to his apartment on North 21st. Give him the time to break the package open, split it up, catch him as he's leaving to deliver to his crew. Nord opted for a quick lunch at Sully's Cafe on the east side. Osborne's electric blue Cadillac rolled out from North 14th Street onto Tower Avenue, passing the NARC and the Ford Galaxy, going in the opposite direction. Back at his basement apartment, Cimarron set a Beatles album, Revolver, his favorite, on the turntable of his Montgomery Ward portable stereo. He lit a cone of sandalwood incense in a mushroom-shaped burner, a gift from his girlfriend going to the U down in Madison, and passed through the red beaded curtain into the kitchenette. He set the package on the table after sweeping aside his dirty breakfast and lunch dishes, swinging to the tabletop a tackle box that was not a tackle box. Cimarron opened it and moved aside a scale, a roll of plastic bags, and other tools to get to a Stanley retractable razor blade. Using the blade, he slipped the packing tape that held down the package's flaps, singing along with George Harrison on Taxman, his voice an imitation of a nasally Liverpudlian, and entirely missed the knock at the door, the door's soft opening whine, the footsteps. Cimarron jumped when the hand rested on his shoulder. So that's how the story begins. A few pages later, we're introduced to the PI or private eye of this story. Stephen Mayhew sat in his office above Worldwide News and Views, the downtown corner shop source for newspapers and magazines of every stripe, from Tiger Beat and Sixteen Magazine to Buff Swinger and Playboy. Candy bars people hadn't yearned for since the Great Depression were laid out in the shop's display case, along with cigars, cigarettes, and pipe tobacco. The latest entry was a fast-selling product, zigzag, slow-burning cigarette papers. Mayhew wondered about the cigarette papers occasionally, but now he was more inclined to pull at his hair. He was letting his crew cut grow out, the crew cut he'd had since 1952, a young enlistee serving in Germany during the Korean War. Jane, the woman with a doctorate in English who taught at the university in town, and Mayhew, had been dating for about six months, and initially she liked his whiskery skull. Now she told him to go for that long hair look. Mayhew was giving it a shot. It looked like crap. Tanner agreed. I'd cut it if I were you. Tanner was his secretary, and no surprise, she kept the place running so the rent check could be handed over every month to Scorich, the owner of Worldwide News and Views, as well as the rest of the buildings on the block. That's if I were you, but I'm just the secretary. He set aside the mirror he'd been tilting this way, that way. His brother had the mirror in the Navy during the war in the Pacific, meant to signal search planes if you were floating in the middle of the ocean on a rubber raft. I don't know, Tanner. I look like a porcupine with a limp quills. You can wet it and brush it down for now, Stephen. You've got a couple of borderline weepy parents. Well, one is anyway. They would like to meet with you. He waved off Tanner's coiffure suggestions. Send them in. Just tell them I'm a work in progress. Oh, I'll do that all right. Like Stephen Mayhew, Patricia and Randall Enstead were in their 30s. She was originally from Solon Springs, a rural community about a half hour's drive out of town, and he was a lifelong superior resident born at home, just like his nine sisters and brothers, and raised in the city's hard scrabble North End. The Ensteads now lived what anybody in the city would assume was a good life in Billings Park on the west side. Mayhew welcomed the Ensteads, offered them coffee, which they declined, and then the three of them sat quietly until he said, what can I help you with today? 
Randall was stone, not wanting to be where he was at that time of day, mid-afternoon. He wanted to get back on the road. He was a salesman. He wasn't prone to say a word. Patricia glanced at her husband, then back at Mayhew. She was frustrated. She took a deep breath, released it with aggravation. I'm not a marriage counselor, if that's what you're looking for, Mayhew said, taking them both in. Patricia instead rolled her eyes. She apparently didn't appreciate Mayhew's sense of humor. With her tightly compact bouffant, the color of freshly minted pennies, and her elfin look, she reminded him of the leprechaun who shilled cereal when he watched Saturday morning cartoons and ate his Wheaties. We are aware that you aren't a marriage counselor, Mr. Mayhew. Her, her blue eyes pinned him as if she were a lepidopterist and he was a run-of-the-mill dusty moth. She would have killed him or the bug zapper would. Has anyone ever discussed your manner with you? You don't know what people are coming in for and you joke? Randall instead maintained his Mount Rushmore solo performance, but at the last line of Patricia's, his tight lips slid into an angry, grinding dash. Miss Tanner, my secretary, she has many times. It was true. He didn't know what he would do without Tanner. He wished more of her instruction would take. I apologize, Mrs. Enstead and Mr. Enstead. My job, I'm a private investigator. You're interested in my services for... Patricia instead pulled, put her purse on Mayhew's desk, sliding his signal mirror aside and snapped the purse open. Our son Paul has disappeared. Here's a snapshot from last Christmas. It's the most recent photograph that we have. Mayhew picked up the photo. A black and white snapshot, Christmas 1967. A young man grinning goodbye, about to leave by someone's back door his hair wavy and shoulder length, the color of light brown to red, may you guessed, he would have to ask. Wearing wire-rimmed glasses, a heavy military field jacket with a black and white striped winter scarf wrapped around his neck. He flashed the peace sign at the photographer. Patricia instead appeared anxious about this most recent photo, not wanting to lose it. His hair, it's dark blonde and He's about 5'9", 155, 160, she smiled. For a hippie, he's pretty fit. Those magazine articles, you know, you never know what you're in for. Her voice cracked. Her husband, Randall, hadn't said a word. How old is Paul? Mayhew asked. He kept a finger on the edge of the photo, not wanting Patricia to snap it up. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a couple copies of this made up. You'll get the original back. She nodded. It was his birthday last week. He turned 23. She quaked, snapping her purse shut, and missed his birthday dinner at Cronstrom's. After glaring briefly at Randall, she turned back to Mayhew and continued. He was gone out of town right after Christmas. He flew to Hawaii, spent the winter there, sent a postcard saying he was living on the beach where do these kids get the money to do this sort of thing, flying to Hawaii? She laughed falsely, rolled her eyes. Randall turned to Patricia and said, you know where Paul gets his money. Not from me, not, not after you kicked him out. Mayhew encouraged Randall to say more. Where does he get his money, Mr. Instead? Drug money, Randall said with disgust. That's why he kicked him out of the house. Mayhew held up his hands, attempting to direct the verbal traffic darting in front of him. Let's get the ground rules laid out before we go any further, folks. He told them that he would take the case. What his rights were if they were interested, daily, weekly, and it had never occurred in the past, but monthly. He gave the monthly figure, too. Were they still interested in hiring him? Yes, Patricia said. Randall offered an unenthusiastic, sure, you probably can't be any less helpful than the police. He glanced at Mayhew's hair, maybe. Mayhew ignored that and asked, who have you worked with in the department? Did you file a missing person report? Randall shook his head. 
No, we haven't. Paul's been arrested before. Marijuana. There was a hearing scheduled. That never happened. He was gone by that. He ran. He wouldn't run, Patricia said. He believes it should be legalized. I told him, we're pretty advanced in 1968, kiddo, but legalizing marijuana? And Paul didn't call it marijuana. He used something exotic like bang. Bang, right? She asked her husband. He nodded. So you've spoken to someone in narcotics? Nord, Denny Nord. Mayhew winced inwardly at the mention of Nord. He didn't doubt that Nord would do the same, hearing his name. Detective Nord didn't have you fill out the missing person report, refer you to anyone else? Patricia shook her head. It sounded to me like he was more likely to put out an all-points bulletin on Paul. He should, her husband said. Then he softly growled. What that boy has done to our family name. At least he changed his last name, Patricia said, patting Randall's knee, but she knew it didn't make the upheaval in their lives any better for her husband. Changed it to what, Mayhew asked. Patricia said, Cimarron. He goes by Paul Cimarron now. He liked cowboy movies when he was growing up, fighting off the hired guns, rescuing the school marm, riding off into the sunset. And that's how we meet Private Eye Stephen Mayhew. If anybody has any questions, I can attempt to answer them. All right, thanks, uh, Jeff. Yeah, questions or comments from anyone, just jump in. It's such a, a detailed and accurate account, Jeff, as you always write. You have so many uh, details and, and facts and such that make it so real. And uh, it's just a, a whole world you're creating. Other folks, comments, questions? Are we going to know how it ends? <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love listening to you. Thank you. I think we need to buy the book. <laughs> okay, again. Yes, in fact, Jeff, remind us where we get your book. Books. Jeff, are you copying me? I'm breaking up a little bit. Okay. I'm breaking up uh, a little bit here. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jeff, if you'd let uh, everyone know where you get, where we get your books. Well, the, what I was reading from and it is more groovy gum shoes, private eyes in the psychedelic 60s. And it, it's available for pre order now through downandoutbooks.com. Um, it's a great series. Um, I'm thrilled to be in it. Site, and you can order it there, or it comes out everywhere April 10th. So you could get it at Amazon or order through one of your independent bookstores, whichever you prefer. Okay, yeah, downandoutbooks.com, Jeff Esterholm, and uh, uh, an artist from the watershed here. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. Anyone else have questions or comments? And, and we'll move along in just a bit here to stay on time, but we still have a few seconds here. Uh, jump in if you have anything you want to add. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, you'll pass it over to me right now, actually. the uh, We're going to switch gears just a bit here and move into, of all things, of course, maple syrup, which fits naturally with crime, because as we were just talking about before the meeting began, one of the things that you'll have to go look up, because there's a lot of interesting uh, background, is the Great Canada Maple Syrup Heist. The Great Canada Maple Syrup Heist of 2011-2012 where over 3,000 tons of finished maple syrup that were stored at the Canadian uh, Reserve for maple syrup in, in Quebec province, outside of uh, Quebec City. Uh, about $18.7 million worth of maple syrup was stolen over a several month period. And uh, that's just enough of a tease to, 
to get you going and we'll, we'll talk, we'll try to bring it in a little bit later if we can, but if we don't have time, be sure to look it up because it definitely ties the concept of, of rather major crime to our uh, beloved maple syrup. So what I'm going to do is read you a, a true story from the, the watershed here. It happened in the Hayward and Rice Lake area. It relates to my dad and my great grandfather who came from Eastern Canada. He was Canadian, French, and part uh, indigenous, probably Cree, from out on the East Coast. This would be back in the early 1800s when he came here. And, uh, of course, was a maple syruper. But before we do that, I want to just put a couple of comments in. Uh, some could argue, and if you do much reading online, you'll see that some folks think maple syrup is just sort of worthless. Why do you want to pour all that sugary stuff on your on your food and and why do you want the the real stuff when you can have the corn syrup or you can have the other stuff that's flavored uh it's just a condiment and so big deal it, it, it's not great but uh here are just a few thoughts and then i'll get to the story uh when we eat things of course uh we have a variety of foods that we can eat in our uh, nationality here in our, in our country in our culture and we definitely eat for nutrition and for, I guess, medication. Some people say that food is medicine. But consider also that food is tradition. It's recreation. It's socialization. It's celebration. It's commemoration. It's recognition. Uh, it's a whole bunch of things. And maple syrup is one of those foods that helps make other foods very delectable, as in pancakes and some other things Debbie will talk about in a bit. So yes, you could dismiss maple syrup as just a trifle, but it's not. And later I have some data on vitamins and minerals and some of the um, uh, content of maple syrup that I think you'll want to know about. Let's switch right now to a story. This is out of, of my uh, compiled book here, the Red Pump Chronicles. And this is from the story Magic Snow Socks. And I put a little bit of setup on this. My great grandfather Gideon came to the Hayward area in the late 1870s because he was a, an experienced logger at that time. He and his father, my great-grandfather, came here because they were loggers from eastern Canada and they worked in the Hayward and Rice Lake area. Uh, Gideon was my grandfather and he came to this area and married immediately Ella, a woman from the LCO reservation, uh, an Ojibwe woman and had four children with Ella, and then she died very young, uh, and I don't know what from, but then he immediately, uh, because of having four kids and then seven more that were coming along eventually, married Inga, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lena, my German grandmother, not my Norwegian grandmother. Lena from Regensburg, Germany, uh, came to work in his uh, saloon and bar that he owned in Hayward, which is still there, incidentally. It's Gideon's Flat Creek Cafe. If you're in Hayward and you see the Flat Creek Cafe, that's what Gideon Wa, translated as King, started back uh, a while ago. But uh, after, uh, in, in, two, in 1908, I'll get my dates here, my dad was born. And in 1916, his dad died. Gideon died in 1916 when my dad was eight years old. And this is a story of of my dad carrying on in the traditions of, of his father who came from eastern Quebec and Vic my dad would mention how the highlight of their very poor lives he, they lived on just a dirt farm outside of Rice Lake was maple syrup that was the only recreation they could not afford and did not have candy or sugar they made their own maple sugar they had their own cow they raised vegetables and he lived a pretty sparse life but you'll see uh, that illustrated in this this is, I guess, what you'd say based on real events. So the story is called Magic Snow Socks, and you'll see that maple syrup has a brief but very important mention, and then we'll go back to some other things. Magic Snow Socks. Abigail darted through the packed, narrow lanes of new January snow. Duck, duck, goose was the game. Her kids called her Sister Abigail, and they couldn't catch her. The good sister's secret was her knee-high woolen socks. Mm -hmm. She wore them on the outside over her other stockings. No boots, no shoes. Sister Abigail's thick hand-knit socks gripped the dry snow, giving her tremendous, seemingly divine, traction advantage over her young pupils. They loved it, and her. Following their agile teacher in games of tag, cut the pie, pom-pom pull away, red, red rover come over, and foot races around the schoolyard. Sister Abigail, perhaps a decade older than her students, always won. Laughter and squeals of excitement set aglow this hardscrabble valley of northwestern Wisconsin 
in early 1917. A timid, dark-haired boy, almost nine years old and always alone, walked past the lively group each day to and from his own rural one-room public school just down the road. Victor, in fourth grade, shared his school with kids of many ages and with their teacher, Miss Picot. During his school hike each day, Victor noticed the activity at Sister Abigail's playground. Her winter exuberance with the children was palpable, contagious. Several months earlier, Victor and his mother, along with a few relatives, watched as his dad's casket was lowered into a cold, gaping grave. Soon after, Victor's older, only brother left for the new war. Play and laughter had become rare in Victor's life. On a sunny late January afternoon, Victor finally stopped on his way home to watch Sister Abigail's excited group. A dozen or so boys and girls about his age tried to break the chain of gripped hands in their enthusiastic playground game of Tom. Some of the kids looked familiar. Soon, a friendly, athletic sister ran over to him. Would you like to play? With a warm smile, she offered Victor a place in their game. New snow is fun. Self-conscious and timid, Victor looked down at the snow and his rough-shod feet. He was poor. No, I can't today. Victor still had on his barn boots. His only other footwear were the old lace-up leather-soled shoes from his recently deceased father's closet. Those were sad and comical, way large, way too large, too slippery, too worn to walk in, let alone to play in with new kids. Embarrassed, Victor explained that he was wearing ragged, dirty socks from his morning barn work, keeping them on because he rushed to get to school on time. His socks had big holes, needed darning, and he didn't want the kids to see. Sister Abigail said she understood and that he was welcome to stop by any time. A sparkle in her eyes beckoned to Victor along with the inviting gleam of bright snow. They bespoke a promise of fun and inclusion. Sometime, he walked home, thinking. Several days later, as Victor did early morning farm chores, the new powder snow was over his boots. His rural school seldom closed in winter except during true blizzards because the 20-some kids enrolled all lived on nearby farms. As durable farm-strong children, they either hiked to school, rode on their families' horse-drawn sleighs and wagons, or slid quietly over the fields with their farmyard speed. Each winter, school day was precious because family farm work often intruded on the kids' attendance during spring and fall months when their help at home was essential. Today, Victor would rely on his simple handmade steeds. They had large leather toe straps, allowing him to wear his barn boots and to move easily among farm outbuildings in deep snow. He slipped the toes of his boots into the straps, and off he went for chores. That was how he would go to school, skiing across fields, often over much shorter routes than he could walk on roads. Victor knew his schoolhouse would be warm and welcoming, with a roaring wood fire that Miss Picot built in the barrel stove. She and the older boys made certain their school was always cozy and safe for the smaller children. Victor was excited. His mother packed his lunch of two thick slices of homemade bread, spread with lard, a small glass bottle she filled with milk from their one remaining cow, and a compact jar of maple syrup, Victor's treat, from their home sugar bush for dipping his bread. When his school let out early that afternoon, Victor skied toward home, staying on snow-covered field trails that led past Sister Abigail's group. They were already out in the snow, playing and shouting. Even from a field away, Victor could hear the loud game of tag as the children and sisters sprinted and turned, twisted and dodged past each other to avoid becoming it. Laughter filled the valley. As Victor skied up to the parochial schoolyard, he saw Sister Abigail running toward him in her black and white habit with her distinctive wool outer socks dripping with sparkling snow. She was agile, quick, and sure-footed and holding something in her hand. Victor's heart soared. Hello, Victor. Would you like to play with us? She knew his name. Victor nodded. Yes, I would. Thank you. Very well. Just place your skis and boots over there by the tree. Pull up your socks as tight as you can and tuck your pants in them. Then pull these big socks, socks over the top of everything. Sister Abigail handed him a new pair of bulky gray socks she admitted. Constructed from coarse leftover rug yarn, they were rough, warm, and just what Vic needed to join the fun. They're yours, Victor, she spoke so just he could hear. 
Victor put on the socks and tried them out, marveling at how he could leap, run, stop, and turn so fast. These were the best things he had ever worn on his feet. He joined with the kids and Abigail as they lined up on two sides of the playground for Red Rover. Their second call was, Red Rover, Red Rover, let Victor come over. Victor darted and dodged to the other side, in free. The bulky snow socks worked again and again. Magic. So nimble. Such grip. Victor enjoyed new warmth of acceptance, skill, and admiration. For an hour that day, and on days to come, Victor found haven from sadness and poverty and affirming refuge he could share, so different from what he had known over the past year. His father's death, his only brother's departure for war, and farm responsibilities, now Victor's and his mother's alone, all faded in the glistening snow globe world Sister Abigail and her students extended to him. Victor stopped by often to play during that exceptional winter of magic snow socks. So, as you could hear in there, there was a little mention of maple syrup that Vic often mentioned as I knew him before he passed on, how that was just the joy of his life, to be able to have something sweet and that they had made at home. And they didn't have to buy. A couple of things I want to mention. Um, how much time do I have, Debbie? About 11 minutes. Okay, I will make this as interesting as I can here, folks. First of all, uh, just so everybody knows that this exists, this is Sprecher's maple syrup root beer made in Milwaukee, and it's incredibly tasty. It, this isn't a commercial, but boy, it sure is tasty. Really it's, it's really sweet. Uh, it, it, it's really rich, but it's awfully good. So if you're looking for maple syrup root beer, you'll, you'll find this on the market. Uh, one other thing, two years ago, we, we bought this book, The Ojibwa Crafts by Carrie Lyford, and this is actually her 1943 book about Ojibwa traditions and Ojibwa crafts reprinted. So this is 80 years old, the content of this, even though it's a new cover. Uh, but their section on on, sir, or on uh, sugar bushing is excellent. And if we have time, I will uh, read just a little bit from it. If, if it fits in, we'll see. But in, in any case, one more time, just remember that Ojibwa crafts and it's Carrie A. Lyford. It's uh, Schneider Publishers. It's available online, I'm sure, in lots of places. Yeah, back to the Canadian maple syrup heist. Uh, about 90%, apparently, of uh, maple syrup in the world is produced in Quebec province. Uh, the states of Vermont, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, some of the others also produce maple syrup. And I have the Wisconsin History or Historical Society account on maple syrup in our state. It says that Wisconsin ranks third among states in maple syrup production, and I'm assuming that's Vermont, New Hampshire, and Wisconsin. But of course, maple syrup is produced other places. Uh, it said that around 1860 is when maple syrup became the less used uh, sweetener in Wisconsin, that sugar did come in in the 1860s. But up to that point, it, uh, for a lot of people, it was the, the main source of, of sugar. For folks like my grandfather's family there, where they were very poor, it probably was the, <laughs> excuse me, the only thing sweet that they had. The uh, <laughs> Debbie is going to cover some really interesting maple syrup recipes as soon as I'm done with my portion here. One of the interesting things is in 1930, the, the first cooperative of maple syrup producers in Wisconsin was formed. Uh, 1930, and it was formed in it, as the Pierce County Maple Syrup Producers Association. So Pierce County is right on the, the tip of our watershed down there where uh, Prescott is and other cities that you know, and that's right in the, the bottom portion of the, the St. Croix watershed. So again, the Pierce County Maple Syrup Producers Association, uh, a correct number, was founded in 1932, and then marketing has expanded from there in Wisconsin. From the, this is from the, uh, the Butternut Mountain Farm in Vermont, and a couple of interesting things about maple syrup with nutrition. I'll just read from their script here. It says, unlike table syrups, and by that they mean some of the other syrups you might find to be used on pancakes, and that sometimes is called maple syrup, but it really isn't. Unlike table syrups, pure maple syrup has nutritional value. 
According to the USDA Nutrient Database and Canadian Nutrient File, as reported by a long website here, I can send you the link if you want. But it says maple syrup contains riboflavin, manganese, zinc, magnesium, calcium, and potassium with significant percentages that contribute to the recommended daily value. And maple syrup has a higher antioxidant value than cantaloupe and tomatoes. Something to think about. So it's, uh, again, it is a condiment, and you could argue that maple syrup is just a, a sweet liquid that uh, may not be essential, but it sure makes foods tasty, and that's the role of a, of a condiment. Here's a couple of other interesting things. It says that a, a well-cared-for maple sh sugar maple tree can live for 200 to 300 years, and if it's tapped about every 10 years so that the scars can heal, uh, there's recorded history of that happening. I'm, I'm summarizing here. There are 13 types of maple in the world, according to this article, and the, the primary ones that we use in, in our country are, of course, sugar maple, uh, red maple, and uh, one other maple, which I just forgot, but we use the three main ones. On our property here, we have red maples, and our neighbors, it seems, just about everybody around here taps sugar, and I know that Marty and, and Gary do a, a bunch of sugar making, so maybe we can get a comment from Marty in just a bit here too on that. And let me just summarize a couple of other things here that are just fun facts. There's, oh, there's a brand called SAP, a capital S-A-P exclamation point, SAP, that makes um, pop, essentially uh, maple syrup and beer, birch syrup uh, sodas, but they make uh, seltzer water and others that are made from SAP. Another interesting thing they talk about here just briefly is in Korea, where they, South Korea, where they have a different type of maple, uh, the actual sap is bottled or packaged, and you can buy sap on the market to drink, and it's a very popular beverage, just the maple sap itself. Let's see how I'm doing. Why don't we open it up uh, for for questions here, and uh, and I'll finish up my oh oh yes debbie said judging got to tell the story of judging then we'll open it up and then debbie will come on with recipes back when when we were first married we were living in superior and debbie has been a 4-h judge of, of 4-h fairs for years 48 years indeed uh this is her 48th anyway we were first married and at the courthouse here in superior the um dnr was offering a maple syrup uh judging course to to train judges to, to examine and to, to judge maple syrup at fairs. It was sponsored by and conducted by University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in the forestry department. So there, guys came up and we spent several nights. It was, it was quite a, a, an extensive thing we got involved in and we learned how to use the, the optical refractometer and, and we learned how to judge the different grades and shades of maple syrup, et cetera. So anyway, we get to the final uh, time. We had to take a written test, uh, and then we had to do a, a taste test, and it was a blind taste test. Each person had to do it. And they brought you up to the front of the room, blindfolded you, and then they had a kind of a platter with these little white paper cups like you see that they put pills in in a clinic or a hospital. And it had a, a number of those on the, uh, on the platter that you had to just taste it and identify what the, uh, what the finish was, what the taste was. Um, the, the, the bricks of it, the sugar content, the bricks. But, uh, and both of us passed, we, we did okay, but was what was interesting is they put in a couple of ringers. They, uh, oh, there goes my video. Uh, I hope that isn't jittering for everybody. But they put in a couple of ringers where we had uh, Mrs. Butterworth syrup and also um, just plain corn syrup, the, uh, yeah, the, the Carol corn syrup. And I'll never forget at tasting the really good maple syrups and then trying to describe what they were and missing some, but getting getting most of them right. And then I hit the carol syrup and it was just it was like paraffin or something. It was just awful. So and the, and the Mrs. Butterworth had no comparison to to real maple syrup. So I'll end my part on that. Uh, and then we'll we'll open up for comments here and then we'll just bring it over to. To Debbie. All right. Comments, anybody? I'm sure that may have uh, spawned some questions or comments. So jump in if you have them. Just unmute and come on board. 
Wow, thanks for all of the research you did. I learned so much about maple syruping that I didn't even know about. I'm going to show you some pictures that were kind of done of, of what we do with maple syruping. And Fantastic. I really loved your your comment about, about tradition because I, I know that, that it is it is a gathering point for our family. Like for years, Gary's been doing it for 40 years and our family comes together around maple syrup and we're around the cooking and and the kids now have all, everybody has a job to do with maple syruping it's a lot of work and everybody knows what to do and and it's all being passed down so the tradition is uh, I mean we could go out and buy maple syrup and it would not be the same it's a tradition yeah. that's important to us and you're breaking up yeah, I might see if I can stop it. There we go. Let's see. That helped. That's Just really good. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with Marty. I had our grandkids out at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum this past Sunday for their huge maple syruping and pancake breakfast event. And there were almost a thousand people there. And it, wow. it was just amazing. Wow. So I'm wondering, do they still do? Um, because we're looking to revitalize 4-H in um, Washington County on the St. Croix. Do they still do the the tasting and the judging of maple <coughs> syrup? Or was it that back? Contact, Debbie, we'll jump in here. I'd say um, contact the UW Extension and your local, um, uh, your the 4-H the agent or the, um, your local county fair should be able to tell you that information. Yeah, they um, don't know. They don't know in Minnesota, so I, um, I would have to check with Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and in Minnesota, there's county agents and and that sort of thing as well. You know, part of it is um, it, it depends on whether or not people are. There's usually an opportunity to to be able to submit for judging, um, and there's for each side, and then there's the open division, and I've judged both. And the open division is for anyone. So anyone that wants to um, submit, you just need to contact the local um, fair and sign up as an exhibitor. Okay, I'll I'll give it a whirl and stay in touch through Marty. Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Debbie. Yeah, Marty accentuated there how this really is tradition and it's celebration. Yeah, you could live without maple syrup, but boy, it sure helps celebrate life. Yeah, back to my dad and his dad there for just a moment. They, uh, after my great my grandfather died, uh, they had nothing. They lived on this just dirt farm, and anything they had, they had to grow or make. And, and maple syrup provided a, a bit of joy in a pretty stark life at that time, especially with World War One raging. So, uh, thank you for listening to that story and for other things here. Let's, uh, I think, go to the lovely Deborah and have her uh, take, take you on her venture here of, with the closet doors. Uh, we'll just tip it this way. Hi. Um, <laughs> I just did three recipes, but I have more to tell you. Um, maple syrup, uh, like honey, can be used as a wonderful sweetener instead of using your refined beet sugars and cane sugars. And um, one, of, one of our family's favorite ways of using it is using my grandma's Knudsen, my mother's mo mother's uh, banana bread recipe. And this is what it looks like. And um, I gave you the recipe. I use half whole wheat. It, Grandma always made it with all white flour. So if you're not fond of adding whole wheat, just instead of using one cup whole wheat, one cup white flour, just use two cups of unbleached flour or, or bleached flour. And it will come out the same. A rule of thumb when you're using maple syrup, and I'd say honey as well, instead of the sugar in your recipes, use half the amount of sugar. It's that much of a concentrated sweet when it's in the liquid form of maple syrup and honey. So um, the beauty of the maple syrup is you have that lovely underlying flavor of the maple. 
that you don't have with the honey. So um, I suggest try it out. You can use it in cookies. Um, I would say that you're you're better off using like a oatmeal cookie or a peanut butter cookie, something that's a little more substantial um, when you're making cookies. But um, bread are wonderful, and if you're making yeasted bread, I make I make all of our own bread, and I use either honey or maple syrup as the sweetener instead of sugar um, in my breads. And even if you're making the um, caramel rolls, and instead of using corn syrup, use maple syrup. It's just lovely. So you don't use any sugar at no all? No sugar which, at all. But you use about half the amount of, yeah. what, of the other sweetener yep. as, as if, you would sugar. If it calls for a cup of sugar, use a half a cup of maple syrup. Right. Okay, so use a half. And then um, a wonderful addition to um, banana bread or pumpkin bread, squash bread, zucchini bread, all of those using maple syrup is to make cream cheese maple syrup. So it's a you add the rule of thumb for me, and you if you want it more maple, you put more maple in. You want more cream cheese, put more cream cheese, but four ounces of cream cheese to one tablespoon of maple syrup. And then you get this really lovely soft spread that you put on. <laughs> You're killing us. The banana bread. And enjoy. Oh. Then the other recipe I gave you is absolutely a broad guide. Um, this is one you can really individualize. And I make my homemade dressings in a plain old jar with a lid. And um, it depends on how much strength you want in the flavors. We happen to like the full flavor of extra virgin olive oil. Not everyone does. So don't use olive oil. Then use canola oil or grapeseed oil, um, avocado oil, any of those oils. We tend to like it oily. If you don't want it really oily, cut it back. Um, again, I start with three tablespoons of maple syrup. If you want a stronger maple syrup, add more maple syrup. Um, I use the juice of a lemon and the zest of a lemon. Sometimes if I'm making a salad where I want it to be extra fruity, so for instance, in the spring when the strawberries are coming out or the blueberries are coming in the summertime, I'll do a spinach salad and I'll add either fresh strawberries or blueberries and then some almonds or some um, maple syrup cons where I'll just add the cons, heat them up in a pan, Throw in some maple syrup and just cook it until it's dry. You've got maple syrup pecans. You throw those in, make it a little bit more of a lemon-based, um, more maple syrup, less oil. And then instead of um, using the balsamic vinegar, use a white wine vinegar. Or all cider, uh, you know, cider vinegars, white wine vinegars. You can use... Um, sesame vinegars. I mean, go for what you have an enjoyment. If you want to have something that's really fruity and nutty, use walnut oil and your maple syrup. And then use a really clear vinegar. So those are some ideas. Now I'm going to throw some things at you that you just put together. If you like Brussels sprouts and you like braising Brussels sprouts, get those cooked off, put them on the side, put butter in your pan, add some maple sugar, get that all kind of cooked together, throw in those Brussels sprouts, and they're amazing. If you want to make it a, a, a main dish, make some farro on the side. It's an ancient grain. Add that to the bunch. And if you want to add a little bit of bruschetta or um, bacon, you can and make it a main dish. 
If you want to um, do glazed carrots, you can do it the same way. Cook your carrots, put them on the side, put your maple syrup and butter, then glaze them off at the end. Absolutely delicious. If you want to make your chicken breast extra special, caramelize onions and mushrooms, you throw in some maple syrup, glaze those up, Take your um, your cooked chicken breast, put a slice of mozzarella cheese, let it melt off, throw on those onions and mushrooms, and it is phenomenal. So I guess what I'm encouraging you to do is think out of the box. And um, if you love maple syrup, be creative in your cooking. Don't be afraid to use it. Um, start out with little bits. And you can add to it um, the next time. Jot these things down. What works, what didn't work. Um, I'm a I'm a former home ec teacher. So um, I'm always trying something different. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this little talk about cooking with maple syrup. And if you've got questions. And if I can answer, I'll try. Or tell them about your friend with the uh banana bread and how she eats her banana oh banana bread yes i have a really close friend and she's diabetic so when she told me this i just said joy how can you do that anyway she takes a banana bread because i love to give her banana bread she takes a banana bread she slices it thick she butters it on both sides then she grills it in a frying pan on both sides takes it out and then pours maple syrup all over it now i'm sure it sounds <laughs> delicious it's very decadent um, I also know you can make French toast out of um, banana bread and do the same thing. I've just never done it. Question. You're killing us here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm about to eat another meal here. I can feel it happening. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I think you've missed your calling. I think you need a cooking show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other folks. Yeah. Anyone else join in? Yeah, this is Jim Bishop, and I, I just made some uh, oatmeal chocolate maple syrup cookies. I, was, oh. I, I for, forgot to bring them at the last St. Croix Writers Club meeting. <laughs> but since then, my grandkids have come in and wiped me out of the whole bag. <laughs> but you have opportunity to bring them next time. Well, I'm going to have to make another whole batch. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting. It takes the whole cup of maple syrup, and that's the kind of the glue that holds them together. Yeah. But, uh, oh, my Lord, were they good. And like I said, they're real healthy for you. I'd like to call, I'm going to put Kathy Makowitz on the spot. If you want to, if you want to join the discussion, Kathy, um, Kathy, uh, raises bees and and has an has an apiary and does has a wonderful wonderful local honey. Do you also do maple syrup, Kathy? We don't. We're busy enough just doing bees <laughs> right now. Um, but I loved hearing about maple syrup and how to cook with that because I'm always trying stuff with honey and so it's it was real interesting to hear what you do with the maple syrup so i have a great recipe that uh for granola that has honey and maple syrup in it that's really tasty so it's basically oats butter coconut um honey or maple syrup and uh you know bake it and then once you're done with it then throw in a bunch of um Oh, pecans and actually bake it with pecans and almonds too. So yeah, I love to experiments with cooking. So Marty, I'm in total agreement as you were discussing your recipes. I was salivating, especially the banana bread. So thank you for sending those recipes. It's awesome. Yes. And if you haven't, um, if you didn't get them from me, check your email later. I think everyone, I sent an email to everybody. So if you didn't get one from me, just search it reach out to me and I'll, I'll send the recipes. We need to close this, this I section. Marty, Marty, one other thing. So if anybody is looking for local honey, we have local honey. So it's um, Bone Lake Meadows Apiary. So I will put the put the name in the chat too. Please. Little self-promotion there. Well, that's fine. And it's great. I, I think the, the discussion about foods and traditions is so important. 
Um, I think we need to, we need, to, here's what we need to do. We need to close out for this show and the recording, but then we'll leave the lines open and we can have some more discussion if that sounds okay to everybody. Marty, um, let me make one, just one quick comment. We didn't really get to talk about solid maple sugar candy, but that occupied quite a place in Iroquois and Ojibwa culture and used as a currency. And because you could, you could carry it with you, it was, you could put it in your pocket and use it for trading and for barter. When you get a chance, look up uh, solid maple sugar candy, which of course is excellent. And back to Marty. Well, we're using now um, uh, fairly consistency all, consistently also maple sugar. We have it stored. We don't use regular sugar. We use maple sugar. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a new thing. We, we've been um, purchasing it up at, at Fort's Fall of Juan. They have a really great gift shop up there and that's where we've been able to find maple maple sugar. And so that's fun to work with too in a different way. And of course, um, Native American people wouldn't carry with them all the water. They would they would they would um, take it down to the sugar level, but that's an art. It's really hard to get it to that level without burning it. And so I, we've not ventured into, into that. Um, but thank you, um, Tom and Debbie. Tom always has been, a, he's been a moderator many times for this and Debbie's been a frequent um, presenter. And Jeff, thank you for your great reading tonight. I hope everyone will seek out his book and uh, find the ending to the story. That would be nice. Um, but thank you so much for being a, a part of us. I'm going to just share a couple of slides with you because I want to share what we do now with maple syrup too. Uh, from current slide. Uh, whoops. This isn't going to look real great, but I'm going to show it this way. There. So, um, we have now added to our um, repertoire making bagels and ma maple syrup. And so when the sap is all boiling, we throw them in, we boil them on two, two sides, and then we take them in and bake them. That's my, my daughter and her son um, as we're, we're doing that tradition. My, my uh, husband thinks that perhaps I've upstaged him on the maple syrup, but I've just put in my twist and, and no one's complaining. They, they eat those so fast. And this is also, um, whoops, ah, I wanted to show you my picture of our, uh, what we call our sappy squirrel. It isn't just our kids that are enjoying the, uh, the syrup. This guy knocked off the bucket and uh, was, was drinking right out of the spigot. So that concludes our uh, live from Northwoods and Waters this March 28th. But we do this every fourth Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. I think we're going to have to do more cooking shows. This was super fun. Um, our next one will be on April 25th. It's around the Earth Day theme. I hope you can all join us. Um, it's been such a joy to have you with us. Yep. Thanks, Marty. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Soon. And we'll stay online and uh, continue this great discussion. Thank you and, and good night.